I want you to give me some feedback here by finishing this statement with me. Is that all right with you? Yeah. All right, sure. Yeah, you're going to have to figure out what it is first. I want you to finish this sentence with me. Happy people what? Happy people what? Smile a lot. Happy people pray. That's a good Christian response. Laugh. Happy people laugh. What else? Happy people are joyful. You're giving it all away. <laughs> Happy people what? Rejoice. Happy people rejoice. That's pretty good. You got that from the song, didn't you? <laughs> Would you consider yourself a happy person? Here's another way of saying it, or asking it. Would those around you or those who live with you think you're a happy person? Oh, a little more convicting, isn't it? Whether you consider it the same thing or not, uh, today we're going to talk about uh, something we just sang about, and that is inexpressible joy. It comes actually from 1 Peter chapter 1, where we will be today. For as much as we make of our happiness... For as much as we make of our happiness, I I would say this. I think our happiness is relatively unstable. Would you agree? Unstable. Especially in the days in which we are living as I consider this subject. I'm so glad that God offers us something that is stable, that is unwavering, that is unshakable, that is steady. Today we're going to talk about this, this emotion, inexpressible joy, and we're going to do that by going to 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9. This Advent, we've been looking back at the first Christmas. We've been looking back at the celebration of the Christ child. And we've been looking ahead to the second Advent, the coming of Christ when He, is, when he establishes His kingdom on earth. And, and, and we've been going through the traditional Advent themes. Can you name them with me? The, the first week we talked about what? None of you? Thanks a lot. Hope, I had to look to. Peace, love, thank you. And now joy, now joy. Go with me to 1 Peter 1. I'm going to start at verse 6. It begins this way. In this, you rejoice. You express joy. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. Uh, Despite what you're going through in the moment... Um, you rejoice. Verse 7, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, we've got the down payment now, but we look ahead with hope to what is to come when we stand face to face with Jesus. What's coming in the revelation in the second advent. It goes on to say this in verse 8, though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him, there's faith involved, and you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. In other words, there aren't words to describe the kind of thing that you're, you're, you're feeling, you're, you're, you're sensing in your heart. Obtaining, it says, verse 9, the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. As we dig into this a little bit deeper, I want you to consider what inexpressible joy really looks like. Uh, Before we do that, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, grateful to be gathered together. You promise that where two or more are gathered in your name, you're there and you're doing some something special. So whether you're here in person, or you're with us online, or watching this later, wherever this finds us, Lord, we pray that You would speak into our lives, that You would cause us to recognize the truth of Your Word, and that, Lord Jesus, we would walk in it. We thank You for this encouragement today. We ask uh, that You would speak to us, and through me as I articulate what the words tell us, and what your message is for us today. We pray all of this in your name. Amen. Amen. It's important to understand that our relationship with God 
is first and foremost about position. And when I make a statement like that, it's about position. What I mean is by position, I mean you're in right standing with God because of Jesus and what He has done for us and that He did come as the Christ child. He did come to serve us. He did go to the cross. He did rise again from the dead and conquer sin, death, and the enemy. And although, like I said, we have the down payment and what is ahead is the hope that it is finished and will be finished face to face one day when we stand before Him, our hope rests not not in what we see around us, but what is to come, the salvation of our souls. That's our position. Position. You're in right standing with God, not because of what you have done or what you haven't done, but by what Jesus has done. In saying that, though, emotion plays an important role in our relationship with Jesus. And I want to speak about that today, and we're going to start by going back to verse 6 where I started and looking at this a little bit more deeply, it says, in this you rejoice, in this you express your, no, your, your joy, not in what comes and goes or passes so suddenly in what is so fragile like happiness. No, what is uh, verse 6 referring to? Uh, this is referenced in verse 5. I just wanted to be really dramatic about it. Verse 5, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation, there it is, that's this, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time when, when Christ will establish His kingdom. The second advent, salvation will be revealed in full. In this you rejoice, although now things aren't great or things aren't easy. Now things are difficult. I want you to think about what rejoice means or, or what verse 8 is talking about. And we'll kind of get to this as well. Inexpressible joy. I want you to think about what that actually means. Uh, I recall a Christmas uh, when my kids were younger. I think, if I'm not mistaken, they were like 2, 4, and 6, okay? And on this particular Christmas, they had a really exciting gift coming. Does that, anyone remember the we? I know this is like an old game console. Now it's totally uncool. But, um, but this was back when that was very, very popular, the Nintendo Wii. And they didn't know they were getting it. In fact, this was quite an extravagant gift. But they, they didn't get it from my wife and I. They got it from the in-laws. And, uh, and so we're like filming this. And, and we're really excited to give it to them because we knew what it was. And uh, it's funny because my oldest... Matthias, he, he was like, I don't know, maybe six years old, and he was kind of the, the front runner in leading this unpacking, and, and he was you know, ready to tear it open, and, and the other two were just looking at, at it in excitement, and, and, and it comes to mind because we have this on film, and uh, he tears it open, and he just freaks out, because he knows exactly what it is. He, he says, it's a wee, and he screams and the other two are like, what is that? But he's so excited that they just kind of get the vibe. And, and they're just like, yay, I don't know what it is, but uh, yeah. It's a picture of what inexpressible joy is. That when you know what you have, it just flows out from you. When, when you know what you have in your heart, it just, it just comes out. Sometimes not even in words. And it's funny, the, the, the two younger ones kind of had this disingenuine, like, oh, yay. <laughs> That's not true joy. Joy is found when we know what we have in our hearts and know for certain what our future holds. I want you to allow, allow me to just press in on this for a moment because I believe that if, if, if church, you have Jesus in your heart, then, then the joy of the Lord will show. Okay? Hear me on this for a second. 
I don't have any one person in mind when I think about this, but, but wouldn't you agree that if Jesus is in your heart and you know what you have, it will express itself in joy just by show of hands? Do, do, you, do you agree with that? Uh, like, like a saying I like to use, and I'm going to say it again, if Jesus is in your heart, notify your face. You, you know what I mean? Like, like it, it will actually show, Right? Another way to put it is if you're always bent out of shape and something is always wrong and you're, you're always looking for a problem and you're never over your problems, you're always focused on your problems and you never smile, for example, then something's wrong. Then, then something's wrong. Because joy is something that flows from the person who has it and knows what they have and are certain in what they have. I say this and want to dig a little further because I think sometimes we think or else we give off the impression that living the Christian life has to be very serious. And you probably get some of that from me and from pastors who, you know, always like to talk about doctrine and really important things, right? And because we're missional, we have a particular focus when we need to be focused. Because the world is going you know where and we better be focused on getting them from there to here. And all of that's true. We should have that focus. And we, and, and we should be serious about what we believe. And yet I think sometimes we give off the impression, at very least, that we're not happy at all. Kind of like that picture of Jesus. Like many pictures of Jesus. Just a stern face. Blonde hair. He didn't look like that, nor did he probably act like that. (laughs) Think about Jesus for a second here. His first miracle was turning water into wine at a reception. Receptions are fun, right? Right? Well, they're supposed to be fun. Some people think certain things are fun that aren't really fun and lasting, but that's not where I'm going with this. Think about his life with his disciples. Do you think Jesus enjoyed his time with them? Yes, I know Isaiah tells us that he carried our griefs and sorrows. And that's accurate, but those are our sorrows. That's our grief. But I recall what John 14, for example, tells us. Right before He's about to go to the cross, right before He goes to the garden and is sitting in sorrow, and yet He says this in John 14 to His disciples. He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in Me. For I'm going to prepare a place for you and I'll come again. I'm going to come back. In other words, stop acting like you are. And put a smile on your face and enjoy it. For I'm coming back. I'm returning. Their hope was not found in the circumstances that were before them on this earth. It was found in something to come. That is true hope. That is true belief that what God has for us is lasting and eternal. I want you to think about that because sometimes we get this impression that Jesus, oh, He wasn't any fun. He wasn't happy. No, Jesus enjoyed good company with His friends. He was good around kids. That says something, doesn't it? He laughed. He smiled. He had fun. And Peter is giving us a picture of what it was to walk with Jesus and know Him personally. You, you remember that, right? Here in First Peter, we have the, the record of what it would have been to know Jesus and, and His focus Well, here on earth. He, he says it again, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. This was not the focus of Jesus, but He looked ahead. He trusted what the Father was leading Him to, and He was obedient to the Father. These are the words of Jesus. Peter is likely remembering the Last Supper when Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. 
And because He came and because He accomplished what He did over death and hell, we can have His joy with His Spirit in our hearts and one day we will be in the presence of His joy forever and ever. See, true joy is found in His great love for us. in the salvation revealed in the last time. I want to give you a picture of what that looks like. As we've been doing throughout this series in Advent, we've been looking at the prophecies uh, in the last couple of weeks, in this case, Revelation 21. You you might recall these words. It defines what will be. And, And I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Picture of a wedding. A week and a day ago, we had a wedding right up here, and and the the couple was having so much fun. Even during the ceremony. That's right. Even while I was speaking, they were enjoying it. Yeah. And uh, I, I remember they're just laughing and giggling. I had to say, stop it! No, I'm just kidding. I didn't do that. There have been so much fun. In fact, some of the comments I got from the wedding was, that was so much fun. They were talking about the ceremony. And they were talking about how much they were enjoying the, the wedding. In fact, when I went down, I was talking with my wife. She said, man, that looked like a lot of fun up there. And I was like, you should have heard what they were saying. <laughs> but it was. It was so much fun. What a picture. What a picture of that God is giving us, of the joy that is before us. Verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they will be His people, and God Himself will be with them as their God. And He'll wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Eternal joy. That's what's being described here. No crying, no pain, no hurt, no agony, no defeat, no distress, no grief. Can't even imagine that life. If you're going through some things right now, I know, I understand, you can't even imagine a life like that. See, the message today isn't ignore all the problems in the world and pretend they... They don't exist and just put on a happy face. No, no, Jesus acknowledged what was. But he pointed to something that goes much deeper than some place where there won't be what has just been described. You, you, You notice what it says. The dwelling place of God will be with us. We will be His people and He'll be our God. That's, that's true belonging. Our hearts will take rev, residence excuse me, in the home that it has longed for. We will never again be lonely or, or isolated or discouraged or afraid. I can't even imagine that. But my hope is set in that. It goes on to say in verse 5, Behold, I'm making all things new. And He said to me, It's done. Complete, finished, it's done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I'll give from the spring of the water of life without payment. Now there is true living, fulfillment. It's describing true fulfillment. Finished and complete, lacking nothing. I can hardly imagine it. You know what kills, or I should say maybe damages our joy? Inward battling comes to mind. Battling with, for example, temptation. You you know that battle between the the flesh and the mind. How it creates tension with people. And and fatigue. And hardship. Inward spiritual frustration that can lead to outward physical constraint. Maybe another way of asking it is, what are you struggling with today? Today. Because what you're struggling with today is a battle. And it damages the joy that the Lord has set in your heart. Examples of that would be unconfessed sin. Sin, sin that you know you're to give up to God, but you just, you just won't do it. I, example of this, this struggle is Is 
is not admitting that the, the problem that is before you is one that only God can heal. You know, you know what else damages our joy? One of the things that comes to mind is unmet expectations. Unmet expectations. We all have them, because we all have expectations. Ever walked into your house and you had expected it to be the way you left it? Ever have that? Ever uh, have expectations on your spouse and, and you thought they were going to follow through on the thing they said they would follow through on and then they didn't? I'm not thinking of anything in particular yesterday. <laughs> Ever hire someone to get a job done and then they didn't do it? Ever have expectations go on that? It it damages what, what we know of and as joy. And, and I think about I, I think about how it's that kind of mindset that when we dwell on it, 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 it begins to erode what we know is deep down inside, and that is the joy of the Lord and the strength we receive when we trust in Him. No, notice what it says in verse 6 at the end. It says, To the thirsty, I'll give from the spring of the water of life without payment. It's really important to think about without payment. Because if you're battling and you think that you can do the Christian life on your own efforts, like, like do good or earn God's love and therefore His salvation, it's likely you are not living in the joy of the Lord. Re remember, if, if your good deeds could save you, then we would have no hope for we can't live up to the expectation of a perfect and holy God. In fact, if our good deeds could save us, then eternal condemnation would be our only future for every one of us have fallen short of God's glory. Therefore, joy isn't found in what we have done or what we hope to do or what we hope not to do. We can't even live up to the expectations we place on ourselves. Instead, true joy is found in Christ, the one who has fulfilled the law and conquered sin and death and who provides water of life without payment. Don't miss that part, without payment. We don't owe Him anything because we have nothing to offer Him of any value. And yet He still values us. He still values you the same. You've you got to hear that today. He, he values you the same. God isn't like us. He, he's not emotional like us where it's just up and down and as soon as we see the next problem, we dwell on it and we can't get over it. God is not like us. Instead, God is secure and He is strong, and He is unwavering, and He is faithful. And that's why true joy can only be found in Him. True joy can only be found in Him and our position in Christ. And when we have position in Christ, it produces love and faith says so in 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9. Let me read it again for you. It says, Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. That's faith. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and you rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. It's, it, it's a yell. It's a scream. It's, it, it's something that, that you don't have words to describe. Joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory. What, is, what does glory have to do with it? <laughs> Remember, Peter is writing to people who have been suffering for their faith. You think we have it rough. 
Peter's writing to those who have been been truly suffering for their faith. Yet here Peter encourages them to place their hope not in their circumstances, but in Him who conquered evil. And, and And it might be important to say easier said than done, but the truth still remains. The one who can bring glory or good out of anything, that is the one in which we should be placing our hope. That's right, the one who can bring glory out of anything. So what does glory have to do with it? Well, think about the announcement of the Christ child in Luke 2, 13 and 14. And then suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising or rejoicing praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom He is pleased. Finally, the glory of God has been revealed in Christ. All that the prophets foretold, all that the heavens declare, it's found in Jesus. It's what First Peter goes on in saying. You, you don't need to run to the temporary pleasures for you will not find joy in them. The glory of God has been revealed. He has come. He has conquered and salvation is found in no one else. Only Jesus. This is the Christmas message. And so I closed with this. I closed with this. You want to be filled with joy? You want back what you have lost? You want to experience for the first time something that can't even be described? Glorify God in your life. Glorify God in your life. Something that can only be done when Christ is living in your heart. It's not a work of ourselves. It's something that He does in and through us. Glorify God in your life. Rest in His power. Grow in His love. Immerse yourself in His Word. Trust in His unfailing grace. And worship without constraint. That's what I love about this gathering. Worshiping without constraint. The one who deserves all honor and glory and power. And who one day, who one day, will be honored and glorified by every tribe, tongue, and people. Every single one. What a picture of wholeness and completeness. And what a message I need to hear today. Because in the moment, if I were to ask you... uh, kind of uh, things are you struggling with today? You could probably come up with a, quite a list, couldn't you? But as we turn our attention to the one who came and take our focus off that and put it on him, we begin to understand and get a glimpse for what is ahead. Would you stand with me as I close in prayer and we worship the King? There is no one like this child. Father in heaven, we pray you'd be honored and glorified in our worship and praise. And we ask you, Spirit of God, to fill us with this eternal and stable joy. Oh Jesus, we don't want to deny what's going on in the world and what we're experiencing in our lives. You didn't. And yet you promised that by your power and your work at the cross and in the resurrection that you have overcome the world. And that is where we place our trust today. So fill us with your joy. And may that be our strength as we go from here. We pray this in 
your holy and precious name.